going down, man? It's Donnie Houston Podcast. I am Donnie Houston. Check it out. We got a very special guest, man. Representing the SUC, man. I heard his name, man, on a bunch of tapes. You know what I'm saying? I always wanted to just, you know, find out, man, who he really was, what he really had going down with him, man. So, hey, 380D, what's going down, man? Man, what's up, man? I sure appreciate you wanting to hear my story, man. I appreciate that, man. For sure, for sure. What's going down with you? What's new, man? Oh, man, really, man, uh, I'm just taking it easy, man. Uh, Mess these 18 wheelers and stuff right now. That's about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you were saying you were, uh, you was, we were just talking about the trucks and everything. Oh yeah, right? yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I was. I had my own company with like three duelists and all that stuff. Then uh, I saw where I was gonna lose, so I actually got rid of all that stuff, sold it, and and uh, I'm trying to regroup with the company I'm with now. And, and I'm not into buying three and four trucks no more. I just want one truck because when I had all them duelists, I didn't know it was that hard to keep a, a person working. <laughs> they want to work. They say they want to work, but at the end of the day, shit, they don't want to go out there and make no money. So, hey. Trucks just sitting up. Man, it's always one or two trucks paying for three or one truck paying for two. So, I'm just going to give me one truck driving myself, pay myself, and I know I'll be all right, man. Yeah. That's where I'm at right Better now. Better on yourself. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 That's what it is, man. So, man, let's let's kind of go back, man, earlier, man. Uh, so, you from Dead End, right? Yeah, I'm from Dead End. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, Pearl Homes. But, uh, you know, Pearl Homes, we mess with the apartments, the Lings, Crestmont, Crystal Springs, VA. You got Crestmont the Hood over there. And actually, you go down MLK, South Bank, and all that there, all of them, all of my people, man. Yeah, yeah. So you was growing up just like, what, like 80s uh, around the time? Or? 80s. Yeah. I was, a, I was a teenager in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so what, I mean, what's what's really like, what you doing in that, you going to school and you, you playing ball or what, because I mean, you're tired, no, you know what I'm saying? You, no, you know, the thing about it was crazy. Um, I could have played ball, uh, every time Coach Shaw seen me, which was the coach at Sterling, he used to call me a thug and shit. Cause uh, <laughs> I wasn't no thug. I made good grades in school, but I my thing was I wanted to play ball. Yeah. I went to practice one time, man. I, uh, and they were doing layup drills, and what they was doing, they started doing left hand layup drills. And when the dude missed a left hand layup, they got to run over there and get a pop. Oh, they, I w- wait, 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 a, a pop like? With the board. No shit. I, that's when I, I said, oh, no. <laughs> I said, no. Nah. R- I run a lap, whatever, you, two laps, whatever you want me to do, but you're going to pop me for missing a left-hand layup that we not accustomed. We just learning this, this form, you know, of how to do a left-hand layup the correct way. And you're going to get a pop? I say, no. So when he, when he used to see me uh I used to be with all the cats. They hustled and do all that, but you know, that was their thing. You know, I did a, you know little something to school, but I didn't have to do anything. So, you know, my mom then was straight and all that. So, you know, I just knew all the cats that did their thing. And he used to see me, you want to be a thug, you know, and all that stuff. <laughs> but, you know, he knew I wasn't that kind of cat. You know, it's just man, you want to pop a cat for a biscuit of layup? Yeah, I can't you ain't with, with it, it man. Yeah. I can't do it, man. <laughs> Fuck that, man. Yeah, so okay, so you at Sterling, so you over there with Fat Pat, or who who are you going to school man, with? Like fat, who that's man, in a screwed up click around this time that you go? All right, with? from screwed up click around that time, who I went to school with? Fat Pat, Hope, Ron G, uh, uh, KK, and them. All them cats was younger than us, so they were down there just. And you know, we got up in in the eleven or twelve. They were just coming in, and a lot of them young cats, you know, they had murder cases way back then. They was in juvenile and stuff like that. Hmm. Yeah, because they was killing motherfuckers back then. When, them no motherfuckers shit. Get their first murder case at fifteen years old back then. No shit. Back then, you get two years and your ass back out on the streets. Back then, yes sir. If you're a juvenile, you kill a motherfucker. You might be gone two to four years and you come on back home. Damn. Yes, sir. Yeah. So a lot, you know, KK, Ron G, Big Jet, uh, uh, Hawk, Fat Pat, of course. Uh, so I'm trying to think, man. There's so many cats. But like down. Ron G, Fat Pat, you, y'all all in the same age? Yeah, we all in the same and age. And Hawk too? Yeah, Hawk old about a year older than us. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh you had Poppy, Toe, you know, uh 
So he you was told screwed. Poppy all y'all all the us, same. Yeah, all of us knew each other. All of us was young cats running together. No shit. So we've been running together. It's going on like, man, what, I'm finna be 50? Shit, it's going on like 25, 30 years, man. 30 years or maybe even Longer 35 years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 30, 35 years, man. Yeah. And, uh, and and I'm pretty sure I'm missing out on somebody. I'm missing out on somebody else. Blunt, Corey Blunt. You know, she. You know, um, we even knew. K Reno was there at that time. K Reno, I knew K Reno way back in uh, at Thomas. See, K Reno and them used to rap. Man, I'm talking about these cats been rapping ever since I was like twelve years old, man. And uh. They had a, they always had a rap battle going on. And uh, it was K Reno, and there was this dude named Corey Thompson. He used to beatbox. Hmm. He had a group called the Clean MCs, man. And uh, that was, he used to always battle K Reno. He always used to bring a person to try to battle K Reno, but couldn't nobody fade K Reno, man. You know, I ain't gonna lie, man. Uh, I'm not just into, I can't tell you now, so K Reno to put out. Hmm. But I know back in school for us that that notebook and he going in that, then, going yeah. in them stairways or where were they rapping at, he always came out on top. I had a partner named Kevin Vils. He called himself K Lee Supreme back then. That's who used to rap with uh, K Reno. He was one of one of K Reno dudes. He looked up to K Reno for as a rap thing. So that's how I even knew of them through K uh, through K Lee. You know, he used to rap with them cats and shit. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I knew K. Reno from way back, man. Man, okay. So, tell me, how is, like, uh, talk about, like, Screw Fat Pat, like, all these guys. Talk about, like, their personalities and shit in high school. like. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as Fat Pat, oh, Fat Pat always been about music, man. I'm talking about even, even back in the day, man, um, we used to put tapes together. You know what I'm saying? Before we even ran across school, we used to put tapes together. He always had jamming tapes. I always was up on the raps. I always, this dude was a naturally fly dude. This ain't like, when you hear him talk on them screw tapes, that wasn't just for the screw tape. That was him. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? What's up, baby? What's going on? That, what's going on, baby? Well, that, that's him. That ain't no, <laughs> ain't, ain't no ad living at all. Now, how? was a little bit more conservative, you know what I'm saying? He wasn't in that rap thing, you know? It was just when Pat got killed and he was already doing a little rapping and, and he was thrown with the, his vocabulary was, was way bigger than the average cat that was rapping around then. So when Fat Pat, you know, died, he took it a whole lot more serious. He, he left his job and went 100% rap, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, Screw, I always been low key. I always been low key. Uh, I I heard a dude on your thing. What's his name? Russ or whatever. Russ, Russell, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Russ was saying, uh, man, he couldn't believe about all the tapes that he done. I'm a firm witness. Now, when he asked for whatever he asked for at that time, you know, he ain't have no car. Or something. Yeah, he he. That was probably him starting off then. But when he got with Russ, you know, I don't know what happened. But uh, he started seeing a little bit more bread. I don't know if Russ and them looked out for him or what, but I know for sure, coming out that door, selling tapes, that man probably didn't see that. I'm a straight up witness. Hmm. That man was selling some goddamn tapes, man. Hmm. A bunch of them, man. Now, it probably wasn't when, because when he first started out, we had just cut into him. So, you know, we had the cars with the elbows and stuff like that. We was the promotion. And the, and his biggest thing that made him blow up so quick hood-wise, which was before probably Russ knew, was that when, when we go to that screw tape and you and he and he do your tape and he like, what's up, dead end? What's up, 380? What's up, Tobe? And you coming down. You a superstar, and he made, yeah. You a star, man. And people here in that see when, when we used to make our tapes, and if I know people, if I knew he was going to dub on my tapes, I probably would try to have my flow a little bit tighter than what it was. <laughs> but when he make your tape and your tape jamming, that thing gets dubbed. So, you know, I would, when Russ said that, it made me think like maybe 
he was he the rust didn't see what he was seeing. So he probably was buying, cause he bought a whole bunch of tape dubs, plug them all together. And then when he put that tape in, he dubbed them about 10 tapes, you know what I'm saying? So when he finished them tapes, he put that little, them gray tapes, he put that little stick on that mud, that's the label, and here go his master. So every time people come back and they want this certain tape, he dub a bunch of them again. But that probably was the equipment he did at the time. He probably ain't want nothing, like he just want, to get, cause that money probably helped him become who he was. Mm -hmm. That four hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, man, you talking about the uh, slab, man? Talk about you know how y'all even just get into that dog. Like how old y'all when y'all first get into all that? I'ma tell you something, man. Uh, my slapping been going on since I was about 12, 11, 12 years old. That been since '83. That been going down. So. When I was like 15, man, I used to go to the block and do a little hustling. I didn't do no, I didn't want no three, four hundred dollars. Give me fifty, sixty dollars. Hmm. I had a big homie that, uh, you know. So that, you started hustling at 15 years old. For, 15, for but, about 50, only, but only, I didn't hustle for shoes. I couldn't. That's what I'm saying. What you get, what you want with the, 50, 60 dollars? Like? All I needed was a hundred dollars, bro. This is what I used to do. <laughs> the dude who used to. You know, give me, you know, my big homie, Big Ray, rest in peace, man. He used to give me some work, man. I used to go to the lanes, man, and, and walk through the lanes. When you come out, it was so on fire, you ain't. You, the Kingsgate, uh, Summer, uh, Summerwood, all that shit, you walk through there and come back, then you sold out, man. That's what so, I heard, like, at that time, at that time was, it was just, everybody finish, just wanted to shoot. Man, I'm talking about it was, it was, all you got to do is walk through, come back out, you finish with it, whatever you had, you know what I'm saying? So my thing was, I just, I give, the dude who I would give my shit from, Rayfield, he had like three slabs. And I just give, hey, Unc, let me, shoot, let me give you $40, and I'm gonna just take the lack right here. He had a, this, this 80, this 86. He had an 85 sedan to veil, rag top, elbows of old, white flip-flop paint, with jamming music in it. I'm 15 years old. And I give him $40 to keep the car for the whole day. Mm. That was my Saturdays, man. Mm. That's what I did. On, that's what got me into slabbing, man. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And he didn't rent the car out. It was just because he liked me, man. He, he just cut it for me for some reason, you know? And uh, $40, you got you, you, <laughs> you yeah. ride slab all day. I'm, I ride slab. I go pick up my cousin Toad, my big cousin Fennel, and my little partner Money. This is the same cats I picked up every time I got this car. I go buy all of us, we go to the cold bill store. I buy all of us a cold 40, and we gonna ride all day. I'm talking about ride to where you gotta get out and stretch your leg cause your ass hurt, man. And this, and this is like 1986? This 86. Man. This 86, I was in the ninth grade. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when, when do you graduate to your first lab? When I graduated my first lab, man, I actually uh, I was I was grown. I uh, I went to the army, came back. Okay, so after high school, you go to the army. I went to the army. Yeah. Okay. I went, you know, uh, uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah. So you wasn't really like hustling for real, for real, like in high school and shit. Nah, like, it, it was still just, just smart. Just. I, the stuff that I bought, I couldn't bring home. So my mom was, she she was a teacher. So like, what the hell you, man, don't bring no clothes here, don't loan your clothes, or don't bring none here. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I had everything I needed. It was just, man, back then, it was just, you could walk out the door, it's right there. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's right there. Hmm. So yeah. Uh, you go to, wait, wait, so talk about Desert Storm, man, and all that, like Desert Storm? That, man? That that really brought me into manhood, going to the army, being away from your family, and you always hit a myth about uh, if you're the only child or something like that, you don't go, you don't go. Oh, you got drafted. But not drafted, no. It's just like if you're the only child, I signed up because you know I didn't want to be the cat, you know that you graduate from school and you just hang out. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, a lot of my partners, you know, like I told you, I made good grades in school. So a lot of my partners and friends went to college. I didn't know nothing about no college. Uh, you know, my mom was a single parent for a while. So 
she didn't. She thought I knew about uh, what's what's the what's the uh, fast with all that. All that shit, you know, and then uh, uh, student loans. I yeah. ain't know nothing about that, man. See, she ain't know how full my life was. You know, I go to school and do my stuff to make her proud, but I had a whole different side of life where I ran with cats that was doing all kind of shit. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, she thought I knew, and I didn't know. I could have just went, you know, got a student loan and, and, and went to ACC or TSU and just went to college. But, you know, I was thinking, you know, I thought you had to pay for that stuff all at once. So I went to the Army to go to college and stuff like that. But then my thing was I got a bad taste for the Army. When they when they send a person, when they say you're the only child or whatever and you don't supposed to do this, and when they send me to war, and my mom was like, well, man, I'm going to call. I say, nah, I don't call nobody. You're going to have me in Alaska some goddamn well. So I went on over there, man, and that was a uh, – that was an eye-opening experience in a bunch of ways because uh, I seen people how we were living. Our poorest person in the United States is living way better than some people over there. Hmm. I'm talking about it, it made me look like, man, we blessed. You know what I'm saying? And, and we really don't even know it. We're not taking advantage of everything we should be taking advantage of. So um, that opened my eyes. And then the, the thing of war. Actually, because I, when I went there, man, they cut our uh, uh, AIT short. They sent us straight to Saudi Arabia without a unit. So we volunteered for the front line, which is 82nd Airborne. I'm attached to 82nd Airborne when I went to the war because this is how he sold it to us. Either you're going to be over here two or three years or you can come to the front line face everything head on. As soon as the war over, we the first ones going home. That's all I had to hear. And it was, you know, I was a platoon guy when I went to the Army, so I was over my whole platoon. So a lot of cats looked up to me because, you know, they always took orders from me. And I was 18 years old, right? And I had people 30 years old, you know. How, how did you get to that position, though? Well, in, in, in boot camp, they just they just select you they by your motivation and you know dedication to what you're doing, you know like uh what I learned is when the when a, a DI come in there and say, beat your face, that mean do push ups, you know a lot of dudes be like oh shit I jump down there and just knock it out, you know just get down there and give a hundred percent, so they seen that in a little skinny cat like me and I was over the whole platoon and it's never been one person over the whole platoon the whole boot camp system never been that and i was the only one that did that i was in front of my platoon the whole while i was in boot camp never got replaced hmm. so when i went when i went to ait they had this chick because you know you know ait is different so a lot of the cats that was in boot camp with me we all went to ait together so you know that was different because we was taking we was taking orders from a female too but it was cool because it was mixed with females or whatever but you know the sergeant had a little something going on with this chick right here. But, you know that's whatever. But when they sent us over, all of us went together. And uh, when I volunteered, they needed 20 drivers, and we was you know I was a I was a driver then. I drove uh, you got to drive the Humvees, everything with wheels. I went to, I went to school to be a driver, 18 wheelers, all that. Even back then, and that was before CDL and all that stuff there. So shoot. 20 of my guys jumped up and we went at it. Hmm. And um, the, the thing about it, we, you know, your mind will get to playing tricks on you because it's really dead bodies laying around and stuff too. You really recon and you're finding prisoners and all that shit there. I experienced all that. How know? was that shit when you first seen it, like the first time you got there? I just... thought it was, I thought they was bullshitting me. I thought I was just somewhere and it was, um, you gotta keep, you gotta keep your news together, man, because you kind of get the thing, nah, this shit ain't real, man. You know what I'm saying? But then you got to catch a snap and be like, oh, yeah, it's going down. Yeah, so for for about 30 seconds, I'm like, man, this shit ain't real, man. These, But then you get to thinking about it like, nah, buddy. This real people. You over here for real. These real people did right here. You know what I'm saying? Burnt up the shit, you know what I'm saying? Because mostly it was, we didn't have to go in and shoot nobody, really. It was our airstrike. So we coming through, we just clearing areas, you know what I'm saying? And then I was a driver then, so 
I was with 82nd Airborne, they actually did the hard work. You know, we didn't drive, we didn't, they couldn't walk into the desert, we drove. So I was a driver for infantry. So, you know, that's that was my role, you know what I'm saying? Shit, and, and, and I was, you know, I was reading books and you know, you still had your headphones and shit, but when you're doing recon, you don't want to have no headphones on. All the time I'm reading a book and I look up, they was called, uh, I don't want to say that, they, the refugees, I don't know what they called these motherfuckers, but they was supposed to been, I look up, it's a bunch of motherfuckers with no suits and motherfucking AKs and shit. You know what I'm saying? God, they just damn. around everywhere, but they was throwing, they was supposed to been with us, you know what I'm saying? And shit, I was wondering where the, where the, where the, where the crew at, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, they end up coming and shit, we end up still moving around, but, you know, I was like, shit, man, you know, that's that's about the scariest thing that ever happened over there to me. That's the second scariest thing. The first scariest thing, you know, I was a guy I drove, so I go get the MREs, bring them over to certain platoons, drop them off where they could eat. So in the meanwhile of me going over there, shit just started hitting the ground. Boom, boom, boom. Our own people had the wrong grid coordinates and was bombing up. We were bombing our damn self. No shit. No shit. So uh, after that, man, you know, you just got, it, it wasn't no way, cause I seen, you know, it was like a big old desert. It's like a, a long highway and it just, they split like you got a east and a west. So they had platoons on each side of the, the, the highway. And you know, uh, it had like a little bridge thing you could run on. I said, man, you, what if you run up under that bitch, that bomb hit that bitch, all that cement on it. So it's just like, man, you just grab your gun and just like, shh. When that shit get to falling out the sky, man, you might run the wrong way. Hmm. So it's best to just stay put, you know, cause she, so they eventually called it off and well, let me know these dudes, some lunatics, they was laughing about it. That shit wasn't funny to me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was like, man, I gotta get the fuck out of here. And that's what made me like. So you was in that hole for how long? Two years. Two years. Two right. years. And that's what made me like, uh, I was supposed to be in there for four years. I was married, my wife passed away. So oh, uh, we got married, we was 19 years old. She ended up getting sick and passed away. So I got out, took care of our son and stuff. And that's, that was basically my route out because I, I didn't have no love. I, I knew as a black man, it didn't mean shit for us because I wanted to go to school though. But see, a white guy went to school doing work hours, but a black guy have to go to work and go to school after you get off work but they would let the white guys go to school during work hours. That's when I knew, oh, this shit fucked up. Hmm. So I say, as soon as I get out, they ain't gonna be sending me all everywhere and sending me over here to fight these motherfuckers and shit. I knew I wasn't gonna re-enlist. Hmm. So soon when my wife passed away, I was like, man, fuck this, I'm out of here. I got an honorable discharge though. I got all my benefits and everything. So that's that on that. You know? Yeah, so what, so what year did you get out? I got out of 92. 92. I went in 90. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fresh out of high school, straight to the army. Man. Okay. So you get out of 92 and like what's going on like in Asia shit? I get out of 92, it was going down. Hmm. I'm talking about, man, cats having money left and right, man. And shit, I went to my big cousin. I'm like, he was had it going on. I'm like, hey, man, I say. He like, man, nah, man, I want you to go do this. I say, man, forget that, man. You Put got a crib, <laughs> you got you got a three ride. I say, man, I don't even gotta have all that. So that's what introduced me to my first slab. Hmm. My cousin told he was working for the city at the time, you know what I'm saying? And uh, you know, I was hustling, you know, and uh he used to get up, go to work, and all that stuff there. But shit, Tobe was good at saving this money. We hustling, we buying shit. You know, we sell money, you know, but you gotta, you gotta do shit with it. So Tobe, uh, Tobe, and at the same time too, now I'm getting an unemployment check from the Army now. I'm getting a, whatever, I'm getting a check, you know, from them for about, you know, and it's like when you leave, you get a check. It's like an unemployment check down there, I guess. I can't remember what the fuck it was, but I would get a check every two weeks. Mm. Plus, I'm getting my grind on. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So, told me about a lack, man. He bought an El Dorado, man. Candy paint, white top, shit like that. And, you know, he, my cousin's the kind of person, when he buys something and his money get back low, he don't want that shit no more. He'd rather have the money. 
So shit, he was like, man, I'm finna sell this car. I said, you finna sell this car? <laughs> I had some bread. I say, man, I say, man, I'm finna buy it from you. I bought my first car from my cousin, Toe. No shit. Yeah, so. And it's the L, this the L dog. This the L The drop. Nah, it's hard time. It's a hard, hard time, but. You know, it was basically like the same color, like, uh, like, uh, it was kind of like blunt shit, but it, it wasn't a Baritz. It was just a regular L dog. I had a half rag, I mean a half vinyl, and I put, that's what people were rocking the vinyl tops. I put the full vinyl on there, the grill. Wasn't no bumpers. I could have been, uh, the cat tried to sell me a bumper kit back then for $50. His name was Leon Dancy. <laughs> Leon Dancy wanted to sell me a bumper for $50. And when I seen the bumper, I just say I ain't putting that shit on my car, man. You know what I'm saying? But I could have, I could have been the first cat with a bumper, man. <laughs> I could have been the first motherfucker with a bumper kit. But um, I bought the car, man, and my cousin who was on, who put me on, I said, I was happy, man. I'm 19 years old. I done, I'm, I'm finna turn 20. I done shot down to the to uh, Pearl Homes, and I said, man, look what I bought, man. I'm showing my cousin, like, man. You put me on, my money going where it's supposed to be. So, uh, shit, my cousin said, oh, you bought that? He said, hold up. That nigga rolled out some fresh four elbows for me, man. Mm. Rolled them hoes out, man. I like, man, what I owe? He said, man, you don't owe me shit. Do your thing. Gave you a fresh set of fours? Gave me a fresh set. They was, they was threes. Oh, some three. Okay, 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 okay. I gave him some fresh set of threes, man. I rolled them boys in the car, went down at the Shannon, slapped them boys on Hey, that's the first one. Now you ready? That was the first one, man. Oh shit, man. Okay, so are you, are, is, is the screw thing going on at this time? Screw thing going on right now at this time. We was because we was we was fucking with screw before I got slab. Now we was getting the tapes. So now oh, they actually, already slowed down at this time. They already slowed down and everything. So now niggas buying cars now. So now we putting music and that stuff, and we coming through. And you got you know. And motherfuckers hearing that shit like, oh man, they, they just holler out that dead end. They just holler out South Bank. Yeah, so everybody want a screw tape now. When ESG say, watch your motherfucking screw, that was for real. You know. You are you making them or are you just are you just buying them at the time? I'm buying them at the time, at this time. And um, when do we start making screw tapes? Probably about nine or three. Nine or three, because he was staying at his dad's house. So we couldn't really, in you know, the apartments in Broadway, so we really couldn't go over there and go in there and do shit. Like popping them, they were more cooler with them. They was doing something to quail. They'll, they'll, they'll be able to go out from there. They knew his daddy and stuff like that. But when he got his own spot, like around 9-3, oh, we in that thing. Hmm. We in that thing. That's what we out from that mug. And see, I brought up an idea. To, I, had brought, I had took this, I had, we used a video camera and everything. Me and Fat Pat, and then we used to act like we was the police. So what we'll do, you know, they had that uh, bad boys, that cop shit. Yeah, yeah. We used to pretend we was, you know, like cops and shit. <laughs> but, you know, we smoke a drink, we ride. We'll pull up on, you know, our partners, not just know anybody. Pull up on them, I jump out with the camera and shit. We snatch the motherfuckers out the car, <laughs> acting like we police and shit. That's, you know, just on oh, some trip that shit. We film and shit. And then shit, one time they got me, they done snatched me out the car. To th they got my camera and they filming me, they done threw me on the hood of the car and shit. So I thought about it one day. I say, I say, screw man. I say, man, uh, man, we need to start filming the motherfucking sessions. We never got around to it though, man. You know what I'm hmm. saying? Whatever I, happened? Whatever happened to the tapes that y'all was making with this? With this I don't, man. You know what? Well, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know, man. We had that big thing. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. And I think I got that shit from a fiend or something, because <laughs> I know I didn't go buy it. You know what I'm saying? I think I got it for about twenty five dollars. It's like a hundred and something dollar, two hundred something dollar thing. I got about twenty five fifty dollars. Damn. So we just running around, charge it up, just. We ain't, you know, we just young and shit. Just yeah. young doing some bullshit, man. Yeah. So, and um, basically, um, it was like we was a promotion for Screw. You had Stick One with this badass slam back. You got Corey Blunt with a, a drop dog slam back. And, and and he that's how he jamming. You got the Bubble Twins over there. That's okay. How, tell me who who are the Bubble Twins? That's the another Bubble Twins from South Thinkers, man. Yeah. Cool cats. They some twin cats, man. Uh, and uh, 
hustlers, you know what I'm saying? And uh, they they got jammed up right now, but uh, they had, you know, uh, Lil Bubba had a nice slap back. Then you got the Botany Boys, you know, the Cloverland, they had all the black and white rides. They jamming the shit. So Cloverland, them, them young cats, man, like we were, they were like, when we cut it to them, we were grown. Them niggas was like 15, 16 years old, man, hmm. with slabs. Well, you know, full dick that all the way the whole thing, yeah, the whole yeah. thing. And we was just tripping out because I'm just back from the arm. I'm like, who's these little niggas, man? You yeah. know, they, they, man. But I mean, third shit. and third and Shane. That's when I cut into them little niggas. These the littlest niggas in the world. They riding, smoking. Man, I'm just like, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I'm like, these little motherfuckers is crazy. But I cut it for them. You know what I'm saying? And they were doing their thing. You know, like nope. Little motherfucker was 17, 18 years old in the Lexus. Hmm. Nigga, I ain't, I couldn't even afford that shit right there. This little motherfucker had a Lexus, man. So, you know, they were doing that crazy. thing. So, oh, all these man. cats here, you looking at the. the Y'all all in the streets for these, real. These are this, street this, niggas yeah. and, and dog. We jam and screw. Hershelwood. Yeah, that's a little kicky. Everybody's jam and screw, man. You know what I'm saying? This is South Side shit, man. And, uh, that's what motherfucking I think made everybody that shit just blew that shit just spread it. It's just like it started like this and that shit just 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 sucked up all of the South Side. So then it went to Harm Clark most. It just it didn't stop. It didn't stop. I'm talking about the South Side was 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 wide up. Yeah. That's how we jammed with screw at the time. And uh so you had the North Side niggas stealing cars around this time. So shit, nigga, I, we was the niggas in there talking about fuck the North Side and and uh 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 we made little skits and shit. I really feel like we the ones who who birthed Swisher House. The reason why I say that, cause they had to have a comeback. That's when Michael Five Thousand Watts come in. That's when you start hearing North Side niggas flowing on screw and they retaliating at what we said, which was cool. You feel what I'm saying? So that's where we get in the battle of the north and the south side thing. That's where that shit started from. Hmm. Screw eyes, man. Yeah. But we was just voicing like, man, these motherfuckers stealing our shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then, but right now, I'm glad everybody is one. You feel what I'm saying? Because at that time, you know, and the reason why I never tripped, because my grandmother stayed on the north side. One of my grandmothers stayed on the north side. So it wasn't no keeping me on the south side. Yeah. I'm on both ends, man, period. You know what I'm saying? And and riding on elbows. I'm going That's out like there. I'm, saying, on, on the slab, you I'm riding out there on elbows, hmm. straight up. Because it wasn't jacking. But what I respected, what you had to respect about the north side on this level, they wasn't jacking. Nigga, you slipping. If you don't put that motherfucker up, you know, it's gonna be gone. Hmm. I'ma tell you something, man, the second slab a nigga got was Brits, candy paint, bumper kid, all that shit there, original white inside, nice motherfucker. I come in the house about four in the morning. And uh, shit, I wake up by seven, that bitch was gone. Hmm. So, you know, and it wasn't no North Side niggas took that. So South Side niggas <laughs> took that, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, and when a nigga take your shit, it's war time, man. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, bullshit behind that and all that. How man. you find a nigga that takes your slab, though? Like, a nigga's Word like. Word of mouth, man. Hmm. So, you know. Niggas you just know, be talking. Niggas be talking, man. Yeah. You know? And shit. Niggas, it's like shit. What you gonna do? Back then, you know, it wasn't all up camera phone shit. You know, shit. You gonna see what it, you know, gonna get at a nigga. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, man. The, the, and then the cold part about the cat that stole it, he dead now. But we didn't kill him, you know what I'm saying? But we was on his ass, but, you know, we ain't kill him. Turned out nigga was a cool motherfucker. I end up, we end up getting cool. Yeah. You know, you can't, you know, it's like, it's like you have a fight with somebody and then that nigga end up being your partner. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So dude end up being cool, man, and uh, he end up getting fucked up, man. He end up, he, he got killed, uh, I think, in his house down now. Um, of Crestmont or something, he ended up getting fucked up, man. And he was all right, nigga, man. Yeah. But you know, back then, that was niggas' hustle. Yeah. And then, if you ain't had no money, that's how niggas, it wasn't nobody making no elbows like they doing right now. So, what you gonna do? You gonna steal them motherfuckers. And my dumb ass brought 
the car in the apartments. <laughs> I, you know, I ain't supposed to have, I really was supposed to take that home, but I brought it to the apartments this night. And they probably was, they were fucking with some hoes. We found out everything. They were fucking with some little bitches around the way. And, and they probably were like, man, we see that motherfucker sitting out there again, we gonna get it. Shit, they got, they pushed that motherfucker. We found out how they did. They pushed that motherfucker right on up out that motherfucker. Hmm. Burnt out the little alarm wires, and the, the, it was flashing. But shit, that nigga just pushed that motherfucker right on up out the apartments, man. Yeah. Yeah. That shit wild. Yeah, it was wild back then, man. Cause so a lot, of, a lot of stealing that was going on. They might write north side on your shit, but it might have been a south side nigga that did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, man. Okay, you were saying, because earlier you were saying, like, man, you might go riding and uh, y'all might get some 40s or something. Like, when, when does the Serb thing kind of come around like that? Oh, Serb thing hit. I mean, I know it been around before. Man, but the, in, the in Serb y'all thing hit right around. See, that was in 86. So, um, it's a, it's a dude named D.A. Out of, out of South Acres. If you heard of uh, Toast, uh, uh, mm-hmm. Cornell X, little mm-hmm. brother, mm-hmm. Uh, this dude used to fuck with them. D.A. did now, he got killed. Uh, D.A., me and him, was we went to Woodson together, we was real cool and shit. And uh, he had a drop, he had a drop air dog, uh, it was some color, man, he had a drop dog. And he was like, man, I'm finna turn you on or something. I'm like, what? He said, man, you got to get a boom spoon, and we're going to go to Third War. So, you know, I didn't drink beer too much. You know, that's when we was young, just just being adolescents, right? When I got grown, I was like, I, don't, I didn't like beer. So he was like, if I go to the club, we'll drink some liquor or something. But we like, man, I'm like, well, what, what you talking about, man? I jump in the car with him. We, we shoot by Hershey Wood. We grab us some weed, and we shoot out to the, th- to the, to, to the tray. So this is my first time getting some drink. So we buying a four. And he's like, man, the shit cost $20. Now we was having money, but I'm like, $20? Like, man, this shit, you know, when you go buy a drink at the club, it's three, four dollars. You go buy a beer or something, it's a dollar or something. This motherfucking shit here was $20. So that shit was high to me. Like, what the fuck we finna drink that cost $20? So bam, he come back to the car, he say, Man, they done went up, it's five more dollars. I said, man, you full of shit, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we finna pay $25 for a foe, not knowing that at this time, you know, this shit is outrageous right now. So, you know, I get the foe. We go pour it in the booms for them and shit. So we right here on Live Oak and McGowan, right? Man, we jumped on 288. When we exited MLK, bro, I was asleep. I was asleep. I had drunk one cup because I, I, I sipped it. I'm like, y'all put the whole four in the booms. Put the whole four in the booms for him. So I, I sipped it. I'm like, man, this shit ain't nothing, nigga. So I done killed my cup. You know, I done pulled the next cup and just set it in the cup holder. And I'm, I didn't even know I was fucking asleep when I was asleep. So I woke up. We turned on him. I said, man, run me to the highs, man. <laughs> so he took me home. And I, when I get out of the car, he say, go to rest your booms for him. I say, man, I don't want that shit. So I go in the house, slept off. This is about, this is about two, three in the evening. I slept all day till the next morning. <laughs> I wake up the next morning. I say, damn, that shit, that was a fool. I hit him up. I say, where you at, man? I say, let's go get another one of them motherfuckers, man. <laughs> and from that point on, I was hooked from there, man. Mm. My, my partner, D.A. That's the first part the dude put me on it, man. Hmm. Yeah. First Dang. time I, and then the thing about it, yeah. a lot of my niggas wasn't drinking. That's what I gonna say, a fat pad and all these other guys, they were not niggas wasn't drinking that. They ain't know nothing about it. So it slowly started gravitating to everybody, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, that's what I started doing now. I'm finna go out here and get me some drink. Shit, it went to, from buying a four and shit, now nah, we want the whole case. You know, back then you buy a whole case, six, seven hundred dollars, man. Mm. Then that way I come out to the South Side City of Slain, so I'm a goddamn self. They ain't got to go to Third World and shit, so shit, that's shit we was doing, man, you know. Go out there and get our own shit. We drinking and slanging, man, you know what mm. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Man, so okay, so talk about when you actually go and start to make your first, like, screw tape and all that. Okay, uh, that all go in the same thing, you know, like, uh, basically, man, you know, that's what I say, we used to just get, screw a list and everything. 
now it's just like we going in that motherfucker, man, and we, we get our little drink together, we have our list, and we just really, we just watching him do his thing. And we'll grab the mic and shit, what's up? You, you holler, shout out to everybody on the, on the jam and part that, or a little part that you feel like you want to talk on. My thing was, I didn't like, I didn't like talking through all the goddamn screw thing. My thing was, I'm gonna shout out at the beginning of my shit. I'm like, what's up? But I'm gonna let all my music play. And at the end, I'm gonna shout out everybody I could think of. Cause I didn't want my music interrupted, man. Cause he doing his cut, man. When you see this man, man, leaning and 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 mixing on them tables, talk, talk man. About, talk about that, man. Like when you go over there and you actually watch him do his thing for the Hey man, this shit crazy. Cause we gonna get fucked up. You you can't go to screw house and do a screw tape. And y'all not getting fucked up. That's dumb. That's gonna be the weakest tape you've never done. You know what I'm saying? So, man, just imagine the lights dim. We got little lights. This man had crates of. I don't know how he found these records. You know, like if you, man, I want that man. He had them propped up, and I don't know. In his head, he knew where everything was. And we just sit there and you watch that boy. He'll 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 gnaw it off. I ain't never seen a cat gnaw it off. Sleep standing up. Number one. And then gnaw it off and wake up and, and uh, make some shit so stupid, you'll be like, damn, that motherfucker hard, man. Mm. He'll gnaw it off, then just, then just just start going off on the motherfuckers, man. Like, he really just be leaning. He don't he don't be asleep. He just gnaw it off, but he's still listening. And that's like, he'll catch himself and he just like, I don't know what the fuck somebody told him while he was gnawing, but that motherfucker just wake up and just start mixing them bitches. He'll be like, ooh, this nigga be like, then he'll, and then he do it with no effort. It don't be like, you know, how a person got to move their body. That boy just, he smooth with it. You know what I'm saying? And we just sit there. I, like I said, I'm the kind of person, I, I like to see nice sceneries when we go somewhere. And I just sit there and just be looking like, this boy a fool, man. You know what mm. I'm saying? And when he go off, that'll damn near make you grab the motherfucking mic and say, Say, damn, screw you, killing that mother. You know, you gonna say when he go off, you go, you. That's what make me talk through the a middle of my tape. Sometime when I see that nigga just been in, went so nasty on, I be like, well, you a bad motherfucker with that man. You know what I'm saying? You know, you just and then everything don't be scripted. You just, you, it's just like you just feeling it. You know what I'm saying? And then at the time, like I'm thinking, this is my person. Shit, I'm the only one gonna hear this motherfucker hmm. at the first. You know, until I got the game. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, you know, you might say you're a little flow, but if I knew motherfuckers were gonna be listening to this bitch, I, I'd have had to just have my shit a little bit more better than that <laughs> shit. But you know, it was just enjoying itself. And after a while, when Screw really started making money on this shit, and um, he, he got him a spot in Mo City, he didn't want no more freestyles. The last uh, f uh, Screw Tape I did was Poppy Screw Tape, and I think it was called, uh, it was Southside Most Wanted. We went out for Erica Badu beat, and he didn't want no, he said, man, write it down, because Swisser House was bringing it. So we didn't want no more tacky shit coming out of there. So we started writing down, but then this is like the end of, of, of screw life that we were starting to do this shit. And a lot of other things was going on in his life that, that number one, a lot of cats, I didn't like going outside the South Side, so he was in Mo City. I know what the laws be on the South, but in Mo City, that's a different element. You're around these people who, you know, we don't, you know, so I rarely went over there at the last times because I just didn't feel, I didn't feel comfortable in that unknown environment over there. You know, cause you know, we stay strapped and shit like that. You want to be somewhere where, you know, you know you're gonna make it back home that night. So when I do slide through there, I know I'm just riding, having a good time. I ain't on no, on no other time. So we one day, me and Crime Boss, we riding. It was Zero over there, Poppy. It was Shero, Tulo. Uh, I want to say. I want to say Scooperstar. I want to say him, and and everybody wrote down. Everybody just, I was like the third person to go, 
and we just everybody just went off on that motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, ESG was there too. Hmm. ESG, I thought he did something on that. Talk about the talk about ESG, man. Cause ESG, ESG is basically like family, man. You know, uh, when he first did his swinging and banging. Uh, matter of fact, I, it wasn't even about swinging and banging. We was at Core Blunt House one day. Dude named Jr. Uh, John the Riley, man. He pull up with this dude with these glasses on, man. He like, man, this is the motherfucker. He can rap about anything. Anything y'all point at, he gonna rap about it. So that motherfucker was doing that shit. He rapping and he talking about people. And he had a memory that was crazy. Like if you say, his, if he say your name is your name Bertie, I'm talking about. He remember that shit. He gonna rap about what shirt you on, what street we on, what we doing. And that shit was amazing to us at the time. Like, God damn. So my partner Steve Caldwell and Lynn Johnson, they was doing music a little bit at the time back then. So Steve cut in the uh, E. I don't know how they got it hooked up, but she, Steve, the one who put ESG first album out. And that was Swinging and Banging. And that was one of our big homies. And, uh, that's what took ESG into like the rap game, you know what I'm saying? And then him coming to screw introduced him to the hoods, you know what I'm saying? Cause I didn't even know where the dude came from. I just know one day we in front of Blunt House, the dude with glass pop up flowing and everybody just took to him. He was a good cat, you know? Matter of fact, it was a time where you know, he did have to, he did have to kill him. He did have to kill, he had to kill somebody one time. And uh, we was the first cast that was there. He was blowing up our phone and uh, we was writing Pearl home. So we shot over there and- uh, Like right after it happened, he called y'all he, he was blowing us up. But it, when I called his his girl answered the phone, she said, everybody dead. So we shoot over there with guns and shit. And uh, uh, when we got in there, he was he was in there. It was a dude dressed in black, hooded up, gloves on. Shit, dude was you know he had to take care of his business. The dude that shot two people in the house. Mm. And uh, yeah, nah, it just was what it was. Yeah, it right? just you know it was either him or him. Right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that's how we formed. You know, he knew he could count on us on anything, man. Right? We coming. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that was that was a uh, that was a fucked up situation because. That dude wasn't, wasn't selling nothing. There wasn't no million dollars in that house or nothing. You know, them dudes just went in there on some bullshit, you know what I'm saying, and was shooting people. Gave my big homie Steve a part up his head for life. Hmm. He got like, he got grazed right up the middle of his damn head, man. So, them boys was giving, trying to give some headshots, man. So, you know, luckily he took care of his business and was able to come out that all right, man. So, that's what even made him more certified because he didn't nut up because it could have been him laying on the ground. So that, that just made us even feel like, hey, yeah, man, you handled your business, nigga. That's all you could do. You know what I'm saying? No, don't nobody just want to go around killing nobody. But if somebody is trying to do something In that something type of situation, you, yeah. Man, shit. what you supposed yeah. to do, man? Yeah. What you supposed to do? So, yeah. Uh, e... He the one who made me kind of damn near bring, who really wanna, who made me kind of want to be a executive producer type nigga. Cause uh, like I told you earlier, we was at a uh, split second was coming to interview him. And uh, he was like, man, y'all can't be saying that y'all just be chilling and this, y'all gotta say y'all got a record label and this and that. And just a light went off in my fucking head. Like, by this time, we've been doing the screw music. I'm thinking about everybody, like, head, third big brother, head. Oh, that nigga, was, boy, that nigga get in screw and goes the fuck off. I was thinking about, oh, damn, we need to get head. You know, I'm thinking about all the cats we need to get to do this label. So, me and KK over there, I'm like, man, we need to start dead end records, man. So, uh, he was like, man, that's how. I said, man, we need to do a record label, man. Get all these cats that can rap, man, and, and, and put them out. You know what I'm saying? Do it up on the screws or some SUC shit, man. And by that time, that's what made me come up with, uh, with, I got an organization called FU2, Families United Together. 
And it also means if you're saying fuck them niggas, fuck you too. You know what I'm saying? But our organization is about families helping each other. We all not kin, but like if I fuck with you, your family, we could need to hook up to feed our families. And that's what, that's what my organization was about. And that came about right when SUC did theirs, Poppy did. They did three, four actions. What, what is three, four action? Three, four action, three minutes in, four minutes out. I mean, three or four minutes, something like They were robbing banks at the time. I could talk about this because they did three time zero. for it. Yeah. But yeah, uh, three, four, they were not the three, so four. three minutes in, four seconds out. Something like that. It's yeah. three to four minutes in and out, some shit like that. You're supposed to be in and out three to four minutes. That's what it's about. But it ain't the third war or fourth war. That's a different three, four action. But uh, this is three, four action. Three to four minutes in and out, you know what I'm saying? And they was hitting banks then, and that's popping Brock and them, uh, 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 Junior. Them niggas was doing their thing, you know. And that was all part of the situation. Oh, wait, wait, so you saying like Poppy and all, all this shit going on with the screw tape Not shit is going on? Yeah, all this shit going on with screw tapes. These niggas sneaking in doing screw tapes and shit, but on the run from the feds. No, Not was, Poppy, yeah. popping Brock, Junior, but it's Poppy Kimfolk. So you know. Oh, these niggas on the run from the feds. The feds, they playing with the feds, talking about you'll never catch me, shooting, doing screw tapes, shoot, you know, just on the run, man. Damn. On the run, man. For real, man, on the run, man. So, yeah, I'm talking about a motherfucker might call me, pick me up on Bell, I'm, where you at? I'm on Marlon the King. Man, pick me up right here at Bell for the uh, 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 MLK, he jumping out of one car, getting in another. You know, yeah, that's that's how this shit was crazy. <laughs> that shit was crazy, man. But you know, that's when we started our own like organizations. But it was all pretty much one. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that's when we came up with our own look, 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 uh, clicks and shit like that. It wasn't no back then. It wasn't no Crips and no Bloods. We laughed at that shit. You could hear, you could hear. Uh, Fat Pat say something about they don't fuck with rags or something, but eventually that shit trickled in and it had to be accepted because that's what niggas was doing. You know what I'm saying? The niggas was for real about it. So not every, but they not for real. Like I done been to California, they ain't that real yet down here. I don't give a damn who you is. If 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 you shake a blood nigga hand, if y'all, I'm just saying I understand. If we, if we gonna do colors, it's supposed to be colors, man. Like over there, over there in, uh, in California, them niggas don't like blood niggas. Bloods don't like bloods, Crips don't like Crips, and they definitely don't like the other color. And, and them motherfuckers really, they really got soldiers that jump out and ride around and hit targets. So I don't even want to see my city even mimicking that shit, but that's what's happening right now. You know what I'm saying? So I'd rather for you to have a, call yourself whatever the fuck y'all gonna call yourself, and y'all might be beefing with some, other niggas who they call, I'd rather see that than some color shit. Cause y'all beef gonna be about, you know, something other than a color. Uh, 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 it's gonna be about, maybe y'all got into it before or something, it's gonna be about some shit like that. But the red and blue shit, man, I, I can't get with it, man. Mm -hmm. I, and then I have, you know, I have fuck with it. You know, I was affiliated with Crips. So I have fuck with it. But when I went to jail, I actually seen that that shit was weird, you know what I'm saying? Cause, uh, what you mean, at, like what, what was the difference like when you got to jail? I didn't, I didn't like how they sent cats <laughs> on these dummy ass missions. And then my partner was over the Crips, you know what I'm saying? So I'm sitting right there, you know, then I had another partner who was over the Bloods. So that just let me know like, but when I was there, we all was 100, we gonna sit together, you know, you know, cause I, I made it, you know, to well, we all cool. I said, we're going to ride on something else or something else jump out. We're not going to ride on each other. Crazy thing about that shit, how that happened, I got a little part of name, JJ. He was over the Crips in the penitent, you know, on lock. And uh, JJ, I tried to kill his ass a couple of months before I got locked up. So I was in jail about a year or something, fighting the case, and I ended up giving him a time. Uh, and I... And during that time, I was locked up with some other cats. I didn't even know these niggas was bloods. You know what I'm saying? But they were real cool. They were from Bay Time. Fuck with these niggas while I'm on lock. So when we finally get shipped to where I was supposed to be, nigga, this little motherfucker running the Crips. And I just tried to kill this nigga a couple of months ago. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So I'm like, fuck. 
how the fuck I end up? It's like a movie, man. I'm like, how the fuck I end up in this shit? So um, I th- my boy Brandon, like, he like, shit, man, they gave him rank over, over the bloods. I said, nigga, you over the bloods? I didn't even know he was a fucking blood. I said, man, I got a pride like a motherfucker, man. Hmm. He said, what, man? I said, man, I just tried to kill that little motherfucker not too long ago. This nigga over the whole fucking Crips. I said, man, he said, man, fuck it. He said, nigga, if you need me, you know what shit, I got you. So, nigga, little JJ walk up to me with about three, four motherfuckers and shit. I said, okay, here we go. That nigga said, man, homie. He said, we gonna leave that shit alone. I said, that nigga ended up being one of my best homeboys right now. Oh, shit. He like, man, we gonna leave that shit on. I'm just knowing I'm finna have to fight three, four niggas. I'm just knowing it. And he like, I said, man, that's what's up, man. I said, but you know why I try to kill your motherfucking ass though, right? He like, man, shit, nigga, I got to, we just started tripping on the shit. And that nigga, when you're over the Crips, you can move to wherever the fuck you want to be. So he moved in the dorm where I was. He was my cellar. You know, we, we talk every morning. We together every day. That was my partner, you know what I'm saying? And from to this day right now, Lil JJ is my partner, man. Mm. And uh, that's how I was able to bring the Crips and the Blood thing was, was, we was one. We was one, you know what I'm saying? So it wasn't no Crips and Blood. We was just some black niggas eating together and ain't no problems here. But that, that you know what's crazy, you could bring unity to a situation and somebody will still see the wrong in it, right? Because uh, where I was, it was this guard that used to look out for me and do shit. So people kind of went into it, they shipped me off. During the process of them shipping me off, it was another cat that I fucked with. He did, he, well, he was from the dead end. He dead right now. He just got killed about two, three years ago. And uh, we shot to, uh, they sent me to another spot. And he was there because he had got to a fight with a Mexican. They sent him off. He actually told the high crip up there that that I was a I wasn't affiliated with nothing. That's when I had made up my mind that this shit ain't that, that ain't what I want to be fucked with. So he went and told a cat like, yeah, he fucked with the Crips and the Bloods. He so he didn't know he was talking to my cousin. <laughs> my cousin was over the Crips where we was at. So cousin come up to me and say. Man, the dude over here talking about so I said, man, I ain't no crip, I no fucking blood. I said, I don't give a fuck about that shit. He like, man, what you want me to do to him? I said, do what you want to do to him. You know what I'm saying? So however you handle that, that's your nigga. You know what I'm saying? And then what's crazy part, the nigga, I started seeing the nigga in the free world after we got out. He didn't know I knew. He, st- he died knowing that I, you know, I never brought it up to him. For what? You know what I'm saying? Cause I just knew what kind of nigga you was from that point on. So it's crazy how you could bring a good situation and the person see the bad in it. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, that was just one of the bullshit. That was that was just one of the bullshit spurting jail and and I just I just didn't understand that shit, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Nigga made it through it without a scratch, man. Yeah. How how long ago you had to sit down for? Man, I wasn't gone by two years. Yeah. Yeah, so it wasn't a long time, but it's it's a long time when you in there, man. So it was from, from what years to what year? This was uh, 99, no, I did 18 months, 99 to 2000. Okay. Yeah, all of 99, I got out in 2000. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, okay, when you were... Uh you had mentioned Corey, Corey Blunt earlier, man. Talk about Corey Blunt, because he was another young dude, you know what I'm saying? That's my boy, he home now, man. They yeah. gave him a life sentence, and uh, shit. You know, he gave that shit back, man. And you know, he just trying to adapt to the way of life right now, trying to find his way, trying to figure things out right now, you know? And uh, I talked to him a lot, man, and try to, try to, you know, help him out with it whichever way I can, because I know, Coming from the status from back then where he was at, I know one thing about when you go to jail, when you go in, you go in, you might come out thinking the way you went in, depending on how you do your time. So the way he went in and the way he coming out, is he's not thinking the way he went in because you got to think, he was a kid down there when he went in. Man, the man shit down there 50 years old now, you know what I'm saying? So. 
You know, he's just trying to find the right way to make money, the legal way. You know what I'm saying? And I'm uh, basically trying to give him the, the, the information I have. I don't know nothing but driving trucks. So when a person come talk to me, all I can tell you is the quickest way to make some money, get you a dual in a 40-foot trailer, go get it. 30-foot trailer without CDL, go get it. Because it's out there. Because I'm a person who, you know, had to make a transition from street life to working. And it's not easy. But the money that you make driving trucks is not totally like that. But you can make a decent living, a good living driving trucks. So anybody that I, try, that I know making a transition, if you up for it, all I can do is tell you, hey, go this route, man. Because I'm doing it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I got a nice crib. I pay my own bills. You know, shit. Just got married. You know, it's just like life. Life. I wish I'd have did this shit. I don't. I don't miss the things as far as the music was screwing them and the experiences. But I wish I'd have been on working early instead of just just saying I ain't work for no white folks no more. I, not no more. Never. I told my mom, I'm like, I ain't never working for no white motherfucker, for real. Mm. Can't lie to yourself, because that's just a, a, a young mind way of thinking. But the, the thing right now, to me, if you work for a white person, strive for the, learn as the much you can, uh, learn as much you can learn, make the max you can make that. Once you outgrow that, start your own shit. Cause you'd have learned everything from the motherfuckers. Start your own shit. That's my that's my way of thinking. And and some things of, of starting your own shit, like in my case, I don't the company out the white the, the the white company I work for, I don't actually have to leave there and start on my own. I just buy me some trucks and lease them on with them, and I'm still my own person. You feel what I'm saying? Cause when it comes down to trucking, you got to be with a big company to stay making money nowadays. Once you, you can venture off on your own, but you're gonna get the crumbs of the industry. So you gotta stay with a big company, but just be your own boss. You know what I'm saying? So Yeah, yeah. That's just what I see. Yeah, but now, uh, we were talking about Corey Blunt though, but man, talk about like back in the day, man, like just him kind of just being young, cause I mean, he was heavy in the slab, and I mean, just in that whole movement too. Couldn't know about our slab. Hmm. I don't think. I'm talking about everything the man pulled out was sweet. You know, like, uh, hey man, everything this man did, the cars was perfect. You know what I'm saying? When that mother come down, it looked like a dream. I just don't think nobody out slapped him. You know what I'm saying? The closest person that I know came to just out slapping this cat is Kondre. It's a nigga out of Northdale. It's close as mother, them niggas, them niggas there, motherfucker. And them two niggas there, they ought to put a car together. But Blunt, mm. that nigga, you know, and then the thing about what I liked about him so much, he was a good, a good guy. He didn't really, um, altercation with him wasn't an altercation. You, that mean you, you was hating on him. If he ever, if you got into it with him, you was hating on him, man. You ain't like him just because of whoever the fuck he was, you know. But that, that's that's my boy, man, and uh, I just hope he, you know, find his way. In any two ways that I can help, you know, that's what I've been doing. But uh, for us back then, man, that's a nigga who, uh, that's a nigga who make you want to go put your shit. That nigga will make you go put your car up, man. <laughs> that nigga, you come down there and you ride with Corey, you be like, man, I got to put this motherfucker up. I got to take this hoe to the shop because, you know, we always had tight engines, but the way that motherfucker put the interior, man, you, everywhere he went, that's where you want to go. Hmm. He set the trends for the slab, man. If he went surround by sound, man, I'm going to surround by sound, man. If he went to Alfredo to get his inside done, I'm going to Alfredo. If you went to Ike to get his, the only thing I didn't fuck with was Ike. I could do some paints, but I went, I went to that, I went to that dude paint shop one time with Dez from the Botany Boys, and I was leaning on his car. And that motherfucker say, you can't afford that car, get off of it. Hmm. I say, you some, and I, you know, I was having some money, but see, I didn't look like I had money. So I'm like, 
bitch ass nigga. So I started fuck with his brother. I was gonna take my car over there to get it painted. I said, I wish I would get this motherfucker my money. My big cousin was going to Jack. So we turned Jack up. We was the first niggas out of Jack. Mm. So while niggas was fuck with Ike, my cousin and me, we was the first niggas out of Jack. Condre and them started coming there. We was the first niggas out of Jack. We blew Jack up. I ain't fuck with Ike. Never got nothing done from Ike and never will. From that, and his son running now, I don't fuck with now one of them Ikes. Cause hmm. I, just from that one incident, you know what I'm saying? I got a problem with that nigga. <laughs> I, but I, Cause back then I was wild, I said, that motherfucker just don't know how I, I come back to this motherfucker and tear this bitch up. But you know, it wasn't worth it, man. I was like, fuck it, man, how, shit. How do you, uh, how you get the name 380D? Fat Pack. Hmm. Fat Pack gave me that name, man. Cause uh, we used to be in the circle, man. You know, we slabbed up out there and shit. Back then, you know, niggas call themselves jacking. And we never got, you know, jacked or nothing. But, you know, the jacking era was going on. So, you know, we always be out and shit. And a, a car come through and they'd be like, uh, damn, I ain't, I ain't got my strap. Who's strap? I'd be like, shit, I'm strapped. Shit, what you got? I said, I got 11 shots. I got 380. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, cool. We cool. And this shit happened on so many different occasions. That nigga Fat Pat just say, man, you always got that motherfucking 380. Man, I'm starting calling your motherfucking ass 380D. And that shit stuck from there. Hmm. That shit stuck from there. Man, okay. So talk, talk about Fat Pat, man, because he ended up becoming like a, like a rapper for real. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, see, with Fat Pat, you know, that man always loved music. I always freestyled. We we could be riding, smoking and shit. This band could bring out the best freestyling you. You could not know now rap or nothing. But if y'all ride, he gonna throw an instrumental and he gonna be rapping. Y'all ride, smoking. He gonna be like, man, come on, rap, man. I'm like, motherfucker, I can't rap, man. He be like, man, come on, just try it. Before you know it, nigga, y'all riding, y'all flowing. <laughs> and he's like, man, see what I'm saying? And y'all was just going back and forth. But then, you know, when he got screwed, like him and Kiki had this this little competition within themselves, but it just bettered them. Now it wasn't a uh uh it, it it was it was it was good it was good competition. It wasn't like, oh I hate they ain't hating on each other. It's just they better they they brought the best out in each other. You know what I'm saying? So when Kiki got his deal, you know, I don't know how he met D Rec or whatever. Like, man, cause like Kiki had the South Side. The song Body Rock that Fat Pat did, that was a dance to that. But see, he died before he could actually put the, the dance on video. We all got our hair cut from the same people. Tim, Tim cut all our hair, so we all at the barbershop together. You know, the first time I, when I got out of jail, I started getting my feet done, because the jail <laughs> fucked up my feet. And Fat Pat coming, that bitch, nigga, you in there get your feet done. I come to that bitch the next week, he in there getting his feet done. I say, see, motherfucker with them nasty ass feet. I say, see, but I think when 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 Fat when Kiki did the the thing with Jam Down, or it might not have been Jam Down then, it might have been after or whatever. I don't, I can't really remember. When Fat Pat hooked up with D. Rick, man, man, that nigga was that nigga was going the fuck off, man. And I'm talking about it, he was, and the thing about it, he had so much music that. Not, it wasn't a lot of music. I'm talking about he had done this shit without letting us know. You know, we like, damn, we just popped up. This motherfucker got a hole. He's like, man, listen to this jam. He was, we just thought he was going somewhere doing songs because he had let us hear the songs, but we not knowing that motherfucker, you putting an album together. And that motherfucker, he's like, man, this is, we're going to do the body rock dance like this. I can't remember how it go, but he had some little dance because he wanted to, Kiki had the South Side, he wanted a little body rock dance, but we never, you know, we never got to that point. But uh, yeah, that boy, that boy Fat Pat was a motherfucker, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was, he, I mean, that boy was, and then could sing on top of that. That's what you was about to hear next. Because he could rap, but the, he could sing too. That things are mm, crazy. That's one of my favorite songs, yeah. That's him singing. Yeah. You know, the the man, man, I ain't going to lie, you know, we get that boy a tribute every year, you know what I'm saying? And it's just, I just wonder how life would have been, you know. He was talking about Bentleys and shit that we wasn't even thinking about way back then, you know what I'm saying? Talking about putting rims on foreigns and doing shit on foreigns before niggas start doing Because, you know, 
Blunt was the first motherfucker to put some elbows on a 190 Benz mm. way back in 90 fucking one or two. So the, all this elbows that niggas doing with bent, that shit been done. You know what I'm saying? He had them big old elbows on a little 190 Benz. This before the big Benz even came out. Yeah, so them niggas was is definitely ahead of their time. And I and they just would have brought out the best in us because I know for sure if Fat Pat would have made it, you know, that'll open up a whole bunch of fucking doors for everybody else. Now he don't want to be king now. Yeah, yeah. Now he now don't believe he's just gonna get y'all, but I'm talking about for as his partners, uh, it would have been it would have been crazy. Mm. Like we do that we did screw concerts, them them uh, SUC concerts. Man, we was like Wu Tang, bro. Hmm. I'm talking about because you got a bunch of niggas that's SUC that don't rap, but they SUC. And man, we used to go places, man. We, like I say, we always late for shit. But but when we if we actually make it to do that fucking show, man, people standing on tables rocking and uh, man, that little Kiki man, that's an entertaining motherfucker and Pope <laughs> with that boss song he got. Oh man. But yeah, man, back to Fat Pat though. I just wish I could have seen a whole lot more. It's just like he gave a little ski taste and it was over, you know. So that's when Hawk picked up a lot. You know, we supported Hawk. And Hawk actually put out a lot of music, man. I didn't realize how much music he put out until he was gone. He put out a lot of music, yeah, man. Yeah. And um, that's just crazy how both of them guys. You know, out of there, and, you know, matter of fact, when, when Hawk got killed, I was in California with Lil Flip. And, um, Flip got a call, I said, I heard Hawk dead, man. So I called back to the hood, matter of fact, he got killed in Pearl Homes. And I was, I was like, fuck. I'm like, don't do shit to this day, shit. Don't nobody know shit. You know, uh, that's the crazy part, you know. That's the worst part about something. When you don't know what the fuck the reason and the why. That shit happened, you know what I'm saying? That's the fucked up part about everything. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, man, you was talking about with the uh, with the flip thing, man. Talk about like how you even like got into that whole situation. Goddamn little flip, man. That little motherfucker. All right, yeah, flip. Willing, I I was messing with Willing's sister at the time, so man, Willing, he from the Botany Boys, we was real cool, and uh, we he ended up like man, uh. Uh, he, he introduced me to Flip. I just got home from jail. He introduced me to Flip, and Flip was like, "Man, I seen you on on the straight from the streets with Crazy seeing them and all this old shit here." And uh, you know, when you hear when, when, when like my achievements from from coming from the streets, them be my achievements. You feel what I'm saying? Like being able to, I'm the first cat out of Houston that's actually been on TV or. But you know, you don't get no, I'm a street cat, I'm not a rapper, so I don't get no recognition like a rapper will get. You know what I'm saying? So, like, that's why I'm, I got a bunch of shit to talk about right now. But, you know, I bumped into Flip and he was saying that type of shit. And then later on down the line, I didn't know he was, he was even a rapper. And uh, they, they end up goddamn um, telling me uh, um, he dropped the album. And um, I end up listening to it. I'm like, man, this motherfucker jamming, you know. That was the first one when he was with Hump. I'm like, man, this motherfucker jamming. And I'm like, boy, this boy, this boy gonna go somewhere. And sure enough, man, boom, that boy went platinum with that motherfucker. And uh, by this time, he was still with Hump. And uh, they were running around or whatever. And um, shit, uh, some shit happened with Hump and them. I don't know the, the ins and outs of that. But uh, he was on his own now. He was his own man, and he was an artist up on the Sony. And uh, him and Player Skills, they'll play them. Uh, they they do tracks. And uh, they came by the spot one one uh, one evening. And shit, I ain't had nothing by you know in my pocket. I had about four five thousand dollars and shit. I'm out there trying to make some money and shit. Them niggas like, come on, man, let's go. And I just couldn't just get up and go because I had responsibilities. I got chick at the highs. I got to pay bills. But I should have got up and fucking left, man. You feel <laughs> what I'm saying? I regret that shit to this day because I could have caught it early to where a lot of shit that went on, we probably could have curved that. But uh, I said, man, I ever get a chance to fuck with the nigga again, I'm going to fuck with him. 
if Nick slid back through, but I need you to be, you know, make sure my security straight, this and that. I'm like, bet. And then I need you, you know, look out for me, bet. Nigga, shit, I'm gone. And because I first started off driving his equipment, like when he do big shows, I drive equipment to Miami, California. I had a dually. And man, the man paid. Man, I'd be gone a weekend, come back at 3500 mm. And boy, was, I'm, I'm like, man, yeah, I can fuck with this. So that driving was a bad motherfucker, then you're not on every show. So I'm like, man, whenever you got room for me to walk, catch that plane with y'all, man, that's what I want. Before you know it, I'm flying. We, and that man, the spots they had this boy in, the views, I just wish somebody, one of my partners from, from the streets could have just been with me to just experience this shit, man. Because hmm. I ain't going to lie, the dude opened up some doors that, Hey man, I wouldn't. He he opened up my mind too, cause I was just concentrating on street shit, and I was seeing young cats, you know, these dudes damn them millionaires, and they doing legit shit. That's what opened my mind of like, man, you got to do something different than that other shit. You know what I'm saying? So he opened, he opened, he he, he made it to where I I looked that shit different. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? He made it to where I looked that shit different, but at the same time. He made it to where I didn't like music no more, neither. You know what I'm saying? Because when it was all said and done, uh, I just felt like uh, I seen the fakeness in the industry. You know what I'm saying? I seen how motherfuckers are smiling in the motherfucker face. And, and, and when motherfuckers walk off, they got something to say about a motherfucker. I ain't like that part of the game, man. And I, I, I'm not just, I'm not talking about flip. I'm talking about the people we encountered. You know what I'm saying? People that you thought was a solid nigga, and he would talk about his partner as soon as his partner turned his back, man. And, and, and then even with industry niggas, I seen the phoniness in that shit. You know what I'm saying? I just, and that's what made me like, my music might not be for me. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I just don't like fake shit, but as I, Got old, and even when after I left that, I just understood that shit come with the territory or whatever you're doing, whether you're working legit or whatever. You just gotta see the see through the bullshit. You know what I'm saying? But at that time, I was just on. You supposed to be 100. You know what I'm saying? So that's it with that shit for us. So that's when you got tired of the music shit, right there. Well, I got tired of the music shit because actually, I brought a situation. Killer Carleon, right? I had Crime Boss. I had a cat by the name Poop Pete. These these cold motherfuckers right here. Crime Boss, we just wanted to fuck with him first because he had a fan base. Killer Carleon and Poop Pete. Killer was kind of tied up with uh with Slim Thug. That's like my nephew. So when Slim Thug and and Flip was beefing. You gotta understand, my nephew over there with, with, with Slim and I'm over here with Flip. They beefing and we still like, what's up, boy? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that shit was crazy. So uh, I, my main thing was Crime Boss and Pook P. So I actually brought Crime Boss to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the table. He was just getting home from jail. He had did a bid with Pimp C. That's how we was able to get Pimp C on a lot of Flip shit. You know what I'm saying? And um, the shit just went sour because Crime boss, I said I was managing him, so we never did no. We was partners from fucking '91, so I, we know we never did paperwork on everything. But now it was in a situation where we finna do an album deal. I'm like, bro, we gotta do everything right. We gotta do paperwork on shit, and niggas didn't want to do paperwork. So now, nigga, now I'm looking. I'm like, bro, you know, all I'm asking is for ten percent, ten percent. Like if you make fucking. A hundred thousand dollars, I get ten thousand dollars, man. So like, if you make a thousand dollars, I get a hundred dollars for your partner. And niggas didn't want to put that shit in ink, you know what I'm saying? So they did a lot of shit behind my back that I didn't know about, you know what I'm saying? And uh, it was a, it was a few monies that I felt like didn't get sent to me right. But being crime boss, we back cool. We talked about a lot of things, so a lot of things went on that, you know, Crime Boss was on some trip that shit too. He had told Flip I tried to holler at his girl or something. Man, I'm one of them niggas that don't do that. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So 
He, you know, he went, he went, that was his excuse for not wanting to ink the management deal. That wasn't true. You feel what I'm saying? And I told the motherfucker, I said, man, you know, I ain't tired of crying about it for 10 years after that, man. Cause I'm like, man, we supposed to been together. If any two ways that girl said something to you, I've been knowing you way longer than her. You supposed told me, brought her to the front, and we supposed got that shit straight. You know what I'm saying? That's how real I am with it. Cause that's a fucking lie. You know what I'm saying? And he like, man, I know I ain't believe that shit. I said, you had to believe you ain't want to ink the shit. Hmm. So, you know, him and Flip still did some shit without me. And I just, that's when I just kind of threw my hands up on it. And I'm not mad at nobody because I just strayed away from it. He told Flip a lot of shit. And that's what made Flip, like Flip a person that listen to people. And if you feel like you're close to that person, he, he ended up backing up on me thinking that I was on some bullshit and I wasn't. I said, man, why the fuck you tell a man that bullshit? I ain't, you know, it's just a lot of shit that I ain't, I ain't talked to Flip yet. I ain't talked to Boston in 10 years. I just started talking to him maybe a year or two ago. I ain't talked to Flip since. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? I, and I tried to reach out to him like, man, let's get this shit straight. You know what I'm saying? You know, like, let's sit down and let's, let's discuss. But it ain't like I want nothing from you because I'm good. But I just want to let you know that I ain't had nothing ill towards you. You know what I'm saying? What was told to you was not, was not the truth. You know what I'm saying? So. It is what it is, it don't really fucking matter to me, you know what I'm saying? Cause I told him when I stopped fuck with him, I said I was 380 before I met you. You know, when I met you, I wasn't, when I met you, I didn't become 380 when I met you. I was already 380. So it don't make or break me if you fuck with me or not, it don't. So. Man, talk about uh, the last time you uh, saw DJ Screw. The last time, oh man, the last time I seen DJ Screw, man. Mm-hmm. Um, man, niggas was dying. Like Fat Pat died, and um, I was like, "Bro, what the fuck we gonna do now?" My partner KK went to the feds, and we was riding. We was we was we riding. I'm like, man, "What the fuck we gonna do, man?" He said, "Man, don't worry about it. I got a plan." I never knew what the fucking plan was, but. I knew once he said that, it kind of, I, I just knew it was good then. Cause he, I knew he had something baking. It's just like all our, all my, all my outs of the streets was, was closing in, just boom. That shut down, that shut down. You know, my partner K, we were doing dead in records, shut down. You know, uh, uh, then, you know, it was DEA then cause you know, Ron G, you know, put his look, put his, his mojo to it, and that's what made the DEA, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, um, we had everything together. It was just about putting it out then. So with me being in jail when they was doing everything, I just, I had to take a back seat because I didn't know what was what was done or what was discussed. So I had to just sit back and watch that shit just unfold. And it unfolded like fucking four years later or something. You know what I'm saying? I just wanted with, with, uh, with, uh, with Screw, he was, he had a plan, but you gotta understand he was caught up in some tax situations too, you know, as far as taxes and shit. So he was basically, he had a lot on his mind, bro. You know what I'm saying? He was going through a lot at the time he passed. He had, he had a lot on his plate he was dealing with. Mm-hmm. You know, personal issues and shit like that, man. And so with that being said, it was like, uh, it's like trying to work under pressure. You know, you got you got you got all kind of problems, but you're steady trying to, you know, put out your music. Like it was easy when he was coming up, because he didn't have the problems taking over his head. So it was just going straight forward. But then now you done built this whole situation up, and you got certain kind of problems dangling around your head. So it's kind of hard to to put out shit and focus on one thing when you gotta focus on five or six things. So I think that we already moved slow as it is. So I think that even slowed up the progress even more. But it wasn't about money. It was about getting out of certain, you know, tax situations, dealing with certain personal situations, and then putting out your music. So I think, you know, with all that, you know, being 
you know, circulating with him. It's, I, you know, the last, the last, you know, last year or so of his life was, well, well I can't say it was bad because he was living the best he had, more money he ever had. But he was dealing with a lot, you know. That's my, so that's just my take on the last time I seen him. We was just, man told me he had a plan to get us on up out of this. And I think he'd have been like a DJ drama. Or, or, you know, I think he'd have really blew. You know, so and he was the kind of dude, he didn't never change. That dude's always the same. He ain't never changed on me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm talking about he know the difference between the rappers and, the, you know, the hood stars. So, you know, it's a difference. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, never treated me no kind of way. I always had my, it, 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 it was just like shit. It was like first class when you fuck with him. I remember when he first bought his Impala. I had an Impala. I pulled up on him. We went to Broadway. We shot the Broadway. I mashed that motherfucker. I got music and that shit. This before I knew about him even having some money. He was still in the hood. So uh, we go back to the, he's like, man, shit, how much this motherfucker cost? I said, this shit about 30, man, you know what I'm saying? He said, man, I'm going to get one of these hoes. Now, at this this when I knew he was selling tapes, bro. I say, you don't get one of these motherfuckers? I say, all right. I say, you get that motherfucker, call me. But I'm just thinking it's going to take him a while or something because, you know, he's just selling tapes. You know, I'm thinking going to take him a That motherfucker called me about three days later. I said, come over here. <laughs> I shoot over there. He got that motherfucker. Mm. Now, I remind you, I'm a street nigga. I'm paying notes on my shit. So I say, boy, how much you paying the mother for this? He said, bitch, paid for. I say, nigga, what? I say, nigga, you selling that many motherfucking tapes? He say, hell yeah. He say, that motherfucker shit was paid for, man. Damn. I say, boy, you a fool. I say, man, that's when I realized this boy selling a bunch of goddamn tapes. It was now a note on that car. And I'm out here doing everything under the sun, paying notes. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I knew, man, that nigga was making some money, man. And uh, he cashed that bitch out, man. And shit, we out here looking like a million dollars paying notes on shit. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But it was I was just one of them niggas. It was a lot of niggas cashing shit out. I just never was one of them niggas. Because if I got a hundred grand, you think I'm going to spend a hundred grand on something? I'm going to put down on that bitch. Mm. And do it and work my tax bracket. That's what I'm going to do. Mm. Yeah, but shit, the last time I seen my boy, that boy say I got a plan. My mama knew Screw. My mama know uh, Mo and them, uh, ESG. Talk, talk about Big Mo, because I know you said Big Mo, Big Mo, Big Mo, Big Mo, Big Mo, man, he was basically, I cut through him through Screw. You know, we, you know, I come over there, them, them motherfuckers be drinking, man. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So uh, I'm like, I'm talking, I be like, hit this, man. And, and man, I'm talking about, man, that shit be so goddamn thick. I'm like, man, y'all niggas is crazy, bro. But I'm fucking with it, though. You know what, <laughs> what I'm saying? So me and Big Mo actually met through Screw. You know what I'm saying? So every time we at Screw House, we lock up, fuck around. Then it got to the point, shit, nigga, I'm going to fuck with Mo. We'll go pull up on Mo. It's me, Ron, and Al. And we'll go fuck with Mo at Mo Mama highs or something and shit, you know what I'm saying? So we'll pull up over there and, you know, we was just basically like social, socially fucking around. It wasn't like how with Fat Pat and Hawk and them and shit like that. But uh, with him, it was always a good time when I see him, you know what I'm saying? We fuck around, we gonna drink something. Cause shit, he gonna have a fucking cup this goddamn big. Hmm. And it's always, you know, shit, you got something to drink? Shit, hell yeah, he gonna keep him something to drink. So, you know, it was just more of a social thing with me and, you know, it was always a good time. It was, he was a person like, every time you see him, you gonna smile, y'all both gonna smile, dab each other up, talk a little bit, and boom, we go on our way, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, that's, that's what being Big Mo thing was. And uh, I also used to go to this house with Pat Ron and them, see Mama Mo and all that shit there. She was always want to kiss me and shit. And I, I was like, man, I be running this shit. But Mama Mo's, you know, she she older now, but uh, that's what it was, man. You know what I'm saying? That's what it was, man. And, uh, 
it was always a good time when I see that cat, man. You know, when you see Mo, it's a party. Yeah, yeah. It's a party, you know, some drinking some weed going on, man. If it ain't no weed, you know for sure. Hey, man, what you got to sip on, man? <laughs> you know for sure that's what's happening, man. So, yeah, man, that's how me and him, you know, me and Poker was more, more like family, you know, when it come down to, you know, hanging out. Mm. And shit like that. We was we were, I seen more of Pokey than I seen Mo. Matter of fact, how how'd you and Pokey kind of get kind of close? Cause he ain't from Dead End, you know. Nah, he's he more from Yellowstone, Yellowstone. Right, right? Yeah, uh, through Al and Ron. These my other Al is dead now, but Ron, you know, Ron G. That's who was over DEA when KK got jammed up. So that's who ran everything after that. Call himself Kojak. Mm -hmm. He got he got like three, four different personalities. You got Kojak, Ron G. You know, you don't know what you're gonna get, but uh <laughs> that's how I cut it to Pokey. Poker was playing football. Nigga, Poker supposed to be pro. He down there about would have been pro, you know what I'm saying? But uh Poke got into that music. And another thing, like when KK went to jail, a lot of shit kind of came to a standstill before we was able to put the DEA album out. And uh I was fucking with Paul Shivers and a dude named Bone. And Big E, my partner Big E, he did too. Him and, uh, him and Poker did a song together, but he was actually running, you know, running the business over there. And um, they, Bone was asking about Pokey. And they were like, man, I sure want to put him out. I said, well, my partner, he rapped with my partner. I said, well, I could set it up where we could have a meeting and, you know, we could go on, on you know, because I say I know right now everything got to stand still because KK locked up. So um, we went and got, I met with Ron G. I said, Ron G, man, go on meet with these niggas. Let Pope go on and do this album with them. And so if he blow, he can still come back and scoop you up. We got to have somebody to keep going. So they sat down, had they meeting, whatever they came up with. Wait, so Pokey was under DEA at first? Pokey was under DEA at first. No yes, shit. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He was under DEA at first. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Kiki was, he was he was under DEA at one time, too. Yes, sir. Then when Kiki went to Jam Down or wherever he went to, yeah, he was fucking with, he was, nah, it might not have been Jam. Well, yeah. He was jammed down. That's yeah. who put out the, the, the first album. Yeah. 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 So uh, he would fuck with us too. Yeah. And uh, see, K had a lot of bread. So K would put a motherfucker, you no know. No shit. Yeah, K was doing his thing. And uh, she, he, at one point, he had everybody. Had everybody. You know what I'm saying? But it wasn't no paperwork. Back then, it was just, you know, because you know, if it was paperwork of all, that makes shit. We ain't no, we ain't, we wasn't really on no paperwork shit. We just like, nigga, we finna do this shit. So, you know, Kiki, I think he went to jam down or some shit. And then when uh when KK went to jail, I I set up a little meeting for Paul and, and Bone and Ron G and Poker to talk. They got that situation together and that's when you came out with hardest pit of the little from that meeting right there. Hmm. Yeah. Damn. Damn, bro. What else and you I mean? end up getting locked up. Again, you know what I'm saying? I got locked up again. And when I came home, poking them, they was full fledged. You know, it was going down. Yo. Man. That's crazy. Yeah. Man, okay, so, man, what's your, uh, what's your favorite screw tape? My favorite screw tape is my own screw tape. It's 380 on that ass. That's my favorite screw tape. Okay, with the juice. Because I really that, wasn't on the flow tapes, man. You know, like, I, I, I didn't like flow tapes, man. You know what I'm saying? Now, if you flowed on the tape, cool. But a whole tape of flow, I ain't finna listen to that. You know what I'm saying? I like the way he's, I'm listening to, to mixing and I'm listening to the, to the, to the, to the, to screw. You feel what I'm saying? With a nigga rapping, I'm listening to you rapping. I don't wanna hear that. You know, unless you, unless you a Kiki or a Fat Pat or somebody, you know, or a Hawk or somebody, y'all done, but I, I can't even listen to that a whole front and back screw tape. It just gotta be a segment of that. I wanna listen to some mixing and cutting and some and some two timing and some that's what I wanna let bring it back. That I wanna listen to that. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So thread on the ass and uh uh I did uh, man, I got one with no love. I did some uh, it's no love 
and Southside Most Wanted, uh, Dead End representing. Uh, I got a few, man. Serve Soda and Wine, that's for ESG. Yeah, I got a few, man. They're my favorite motherfuckers right there. Hmm. Yeah. That's what it is. That's what it yeah. is. Well, shit, man, anything for we, uh, we close that's up, man? That's it, man. I appreciate you, you know, even want to hear my story, man. I really, that, that mean a lot to me. I'm honored to be here. Man, I appreciate you coming through, man. I'm honored to have you on, bro. Thank you, thank you. All right, ready. It's Donnie Houston Podcast, man. 380D. We out. Donnie Houston.